Welcome back. It's Monday. We have some things to talk about that are really important, and we have some things to talk about that are really important. Uh, the first thing that I think all of us know, I've now posted a very clear announcement on either. If you haven't read it, go, go read it carefully, because there are some additional details that I'm not going to say here about the exam. So take a, two minutes to read the announcement I posted this morning on either. But the exam is this Friday in class. Bring the Scantron, bring a pencil, bring your ID. Calculators are OK, but no programming ones. Um, everything you will need is on a formula sheet, which I've now uploaded. So you'll see the exact formula sheet that you'll have on the exam. It's separately uploaded under course materials, near where the, the practice exam is. Uh, the practice exam is posted, I said this last time, but it's an old final. So there was a list of questions on there that I think are kind of valid topics for what we're doing. There will be lots of help. So Nick, in the SI session, will be talking about all of the practice exam problems. He's open to questions. You should basically go and demand that he answers the questions. Um, and you still have the whole week. So we're going to introduce a new topic today uh, and talk about it a little bit Wednesday, but it's not going to be kind of the in-depth version. We're just going to kind of scratch the surface, and that will be covered on the exam. So the harder stuff will actually come after the exam. But last time, I alluded to this problem, which was the hardest problem on the exam two years ago when I gave this exam. And so I wanted to go through this, kind of as a preparation for the types of things that we'll have to be able to do on the exam coming up. So I'm going to go through it step by step, perfectly clear, as clear as you can. All I want you to do is kind of follow and look for the basic concepts and ideas that you might need to solve a problem as complicated as this, okay? So here's the problem. A wooden block is sitting on a frictionless surface. It has a mass, and it's on a table that when pulled via this mass of the string, there's a pulley system. And there's a hanging box on the other end, box B, of another mass, slightly heavier. And the question is this, what is the acceleration of block A as it slides on this frictionless table? Okay. So you see that you can kind of imagine what would happen here. If this was held in place and then you suddenly let it go, if it was heavy enough, what would happen? It would drop and it would pull block A along this frictionless table. So one good thing about this problem is that there's no friction. So it simplifies our life a little bit. Okay? The hard part is we have to do all of this in the term. Okay? So when we have a problem like this, and you'll see things like this on the exam, you'll see it on the final exam, what's the first step that I always tell you to do? Ima well, even before drawing. Read. Imagine, well, yeah, read. Read is the zero at one. The first one is to look at a picture or think about, imagine how this system would move, right? So you can imagine this system already that if I let go of block B, block B is going to slide a little bit with it. Right? So you can kind of imagine. Now once you have that imagined kind of motion, you can then begin to draw more carefully. So the first thing we always do is just think for a second, okay, how would this thing work or move or what's going to happen when I start this, this thing moving along? Right? So the first thing I always say is to let's first break the problem down and imagine what's going to happen. So we're going to kind of dissect this problem. You remember Newton's laws? are very specific. And the second law applies only to A, or B, or the rope, or the pulley. Newton's third law is what gives us equal and opposite forces that allows us to relate. Okay? So the first thing we have to do is kind of break this problem down. And here's how I want to break this one down, so that we really understand what's happening. Okay? Imagine for a second I forget about that, that lower pulley, right? that one right before B. Do you see that the direction of motion is going to be pretty straightforward, right? The direction of motion, when I let this go, is just going to be down and around the bed, right? It's going to be to the right and then around the bed. And so I can call this maybe my positive direction of motion, just to assign it, and we can see if that's correct. But what I've done here is I've drawn kind of a, a similar system where I just wanted to forget about what this pulley's doing, because it's not really doing anything that interesting, right? It's providing a route for this thing to travel, but there's no weirdness going on there. It's just going around the bed. So the first thing I did is I, I asked, if I move A by some displacement, delta x, right? So let's say I move the center of this pulley to the right, delta x. You see that that's what would happen in our problem, right? If B starts to slide, A would start to slide 
some displacement delta x. So you can ask, if it happens that way, if A moves at distance delta x sub A, how much does B travel? Okay. And this is non-trivial because you have to kind of carefully think about this problem for a moment. And what you will see is that if I allow delta x to slide, or delta A to slide some distance delta x A, you see that there's kind of two intervals of equal length that delta B might move, right? So if I slide this thing over, I would see delta B move a little bit different distance. Okay? And we can actually write this down really carefully. So the length of the rope in this problem has to be fixed. Right? We can't stretch the rope. It's a fixed distance. So if I move delta X B, so I, I move this block B over by some distance, I would see that the pulley system moves twice as far. Right? And you can see that just by the fact that I've drawn these little geometries. If I slide B over, I would see A go twice, or half that distance, I guess I'm saying that. So if I move delta B, if I move B delta X, I would see that it's equal to two times delta X. Okay? This is basically the function of pulleys. If you go in your book and you read about pulleys, if you solve those examples about pulleys, you'll see exactly the same statement in several places. The point is that a pulley basically allows you to change the distance being traveled of an object compared to the pulling of the rope, right? How do pulleys work, right? We, we like to pull the rope a lot, and the thing might only displace a little bit, but it's actually lessening the amount of force we have to apply to it. So if you go to the textbook, you'll see lots of these examples. So now, if that's true, so if A accelerates to the right, uh, some amount of A sub A, how does B accelerate? Okay. So the first question we asked is how does it displace? And we said that uh, if I know the displacement of A, I multiply that by 2, it's the displacement of A. But now I can ask the same question about the acceleration. So this is really rigorous. You probably could skip these steps, but I want to show it really carefully. Okay? This is why in this exam, and any exam we take, we have to go back to kinematics. The first thing we have to note is that if I move a distance delta x, that's equal to 1 half at squared. Does this look familiar? Exam 1, we've gone over this a lot. So it tells me in any system that displaces delta x, I could write down the acceleration name. So I would get 2 times delta x over t squared. Right? That's the acceleration of a system that moves some distance. So then I can write down a ratio. If I want to ask, how does the acceleration of block A compare to the acceleration of block B? I'm just going to write down a simple ratio. And I write the expression for A sub A. It's going to be 2 times delta x A over t squared. And I write down the acceleration for B to delta x B over t squared. All of these things cancel out, right? The time is the same. 2 is obviously the same. And I just get a ratio of the displacements. So if I know that the displacements relate like this equation 1, then I immediately know that the accelerations change in a similar way. Right? If I have an acceleration for the A block, it's equal to one half the acceleration of the B block. Okay? Do you remember when we solved all of these problems as examples in, in, in the class so far? We talked about Newton's laws, we applied free body diagrams, and there was always one extra piece of information, which was called the acceleration constraint. Do you see that in a pulley system, the acceleration constraint is non-trivial? You have to go back and kind of solve and get that acceleration constraint. So that's what we've done first here. So now we have a clear acceleration constraint on this problem that says, if I know the acceleration of block B, then the acceleration of block A is exactly half that. It just comes from the displacement. It's just like a little bit of a geometry trick in understanding that ropes have to have a constant length. Okay? So now we go back. What's the step? When we have interacting systems with forces, what do we have to do next? We have to draw these free body diagrams. We have to draw the forces on the objects. So now we have the acceleration constraint, and we'll come back to that, but hold on to it for a second. The next thing to do is now go back and draw these free body diagrams. This is basically this careful execution of applying these laws. So the first free body diagram I would draw is the B, because that one's a little bit easier, right? 
I basically think of what this block will do. It's pretty simple to think about because it's going to fall down. And I only have two forces there. And we said that the direction of motion was kind of to the right and then down. And so I've drawn that as a little acceleration vector. My direction of motion is going to accelerate. I'm going to assume that it's going to accelerate down. And that's A sub B. And then when I draw the forces, I have the force of rope on B. You could call that tension, but I'm going to keep it kind of careful and explicit that it's the force of rope on B. And then you have the weight of B. And then all I'm going to do is apply the second law. Right? So the sum of all forces is equal to mass times acceleration. Remember, Newton's second law is only about block B in this case. I'm just applying it to block B. So I have in my positive direction, which I've said is down, I have the weight of B minus the force of rope on B is equal to mass of B times acceleration. This should all look pretty familiar. This is just kind of brute force application of Newton's second law. And we'll circle that equation and come back to it in a second because there's information in there. Now the second one's a little bit, you have to be a little bit more careful. And let me just kind of draw to here. Uh, yeah, we'll get rid of the first one. We'll come back and see the second. So now the second one, here's the dot that is my block A. But I've drawn this one a little bit weird because there are too many arrows overlapping, right? So again, ignore the stuff on the right for just a second. Just look at the left. Here's my acceleration of the A block. Again, I said my direction of motion would be to the right and down. So that's going to be my positive direction. So you're going to slide to the right. And if you look at that pulley, it basically has two forces acting on it. There's the force at the top, so F sub 1 of rope on A. And then there's the rope on the bottom, which is called, I called it F sub 2. Rope on it. So there are two forces acting on this object, and that's why I've kind of displaced them, but you could draw them from that dot overlapping, but just to keep them separate, I've moved them a little bit from each other. And from Newton's second law, so just careful application of Newton's second law, these are going to pull it to the right, so I said that the force 1 plus the force 2 is equal to mass times acceleration. Right? This is, again, just block A. Newton's second law only knows about block A. But then, from Newton's third law, we can connect some of these forces. So we can say that the force of 1, the magnitude of force 1 of rope on A, has to be equal to force 2 of rope on A. And the way you can do that is draw a dot right in the middle of the rope and ask how those forces compare. If I'm not right, ripping the, the rope apart, those forces have to be of equal magnitude. Okay? So that's Newton's third law just on a point on the rope. Right at that point. And so the last thing I can do is just simplify that. Twice, and this is simplifying the second law, twice the force of rope on A, which I could call F1 or F2 now, the rope equivalent, is equal to the mass of A times the acceleration. Okay? So now all I've done is I've drawn free body diagrams, I've applied Newton's laws, and I got these two equations. You can kind of see them in the same screen. <laughs> I have this one that tells me about the acceleration of B, and I have this one that tells me about the acceleration of B. Yeah? Can you explain why you know the equal? So basically, we've done this a couple times. If you look at the left, you'll see different examples. But basically, if I imagine this pulley, and I pick a point on the rope right here, right? So imagine this rope kind of does this. Okay? If I pick a point on that rope, I know that. If I have a tension pulling that way, this thing can't accelerate away from itself, and so I have to have a tension that is equal to this. So just like we did before, we've done this with like the tug of war problems that you had in the discussion section. We've done this with the spring problem. If you look back at some of the earliest lectures on this one, you can draw a point on that rope and see that those two forces have to be equal in order for the rope to not stretch. Right? It's, it's not allowed to stretch. Okay. So now we have two equations, and we wanted to find what's the acceleration of block A. That was what all of this was set up to do. What is the acceleration of block A as it slides in this picture? So we have three pieces of information. One I'm not going to show because we'll, we'll come to it in a second. The first piece is always going to be our acceleration constraint. If you have a problem and you're missing information and you don't have the acceleration constraint, you need to find it. In this one, it's a bit tricky, but in most, if I have two blocks kind of tied together to a rope, 
they're going to accelerate at the same rate. Right? That's the typical acceleration constraint. In this case, it's weird because of this pull loop, and so we had to be more careful. The other two pieces of information we have are these applications of Newton's second law on these two different objects. Okay? So now I'm just going to work, and here's where we kind of turn it into a mathematical churn. So the first thing I do is I'm going to take this equation for the block A. I'm going to solve basically for the acceleration of block A. And I said that it's already twice the force of rope on A, but that's equivalent to the, rope of, the, the force of rope on B. And that was just what we said a second ago, this, this third law. Then I can take the equation, I'll show it to you again, this one at the top. You see that this equation had force of rope on B in it. And so I'm going to plug that equation, rearrange, into my algebra. So I now have twice force of rope on B. This came from applying Newton's second law to the B box. And then I'm just manipulating, right? Weight is equal to the mass of B times G. And then this MBAA, this comes from this expression, right? Mass of A times the acceleration of A is basically equal to force of rope on A, which is equivalent to force of rope on B. Okay? So if you don't see the algebra easily, just go back and check on your own right after class. You go through these steps, you're solving for the acceleration of A. Okay? I'm going to skip a couple steps of algebra to get to basically the, the bottom. That ultimately, solving for this acceleration of the A block gives me this expression that it's twice the mass of the B block times G plus this funny sum, the mass of A plus four times the mass of B. Okay? So what I want you to do at least, at the very, very least, is to go back and fill in these sets of algebra to solve for that acceleration again. Okay? Now the second thing to do, and I'll leave this up to you as kind of a quick assignment after lecture today, is make sure that this thing is a same solution. What if the block B is zero? What if the block A is zero? Right? You can ask a lot of different questions and see, does this actually make sense? Okay? So I want you to go through. You now all have this kind of worked out in steps. What did we do? We applied Newton's laws. We drew free body diagrams. We looked for an acceleration constraint. And we drew the picture from the beginning and imagined the motion. We did that all in the reverse order of one. This is the basic recipe for all sorts of different problems that you'll see, especially on Friday, but also in the final exam. Okay? So now you have the rigorous solution. You can brood over it. You can ask the TA about it. You can ask Nick about it. But I want you to really understand, kind of look through all of this algebra and try to understand some of the physics. Okay? And sanity checking the answer is probably the best way to understand it. Okay? So let's move on. Uh, one note, I would say that this problem will very likely not be on the exam. Okay? <laughs> However, the different aspects of this particular problem that we just went over will almost certainly be on the exam. Right? So you won't see this particular situation on the exam, but you will see situations that involve the same pieces that we just went through. So if you can understand everything that we just went through here, you'll be able to apply it to just about any similar situation, okay? And now we can move on. This is a new topic. We're just going to introduce it today and Wednesday. We won't be very heavily tested on this yet, and we'll come back to it after the exam. Some of you have heard of this, but the intuition for torque is actually very challenging. We're going to introduce and begin to understand the rotational equivalent of force, which we call torque. I think some of you probably have an intuition, what, when I say a torque wrench, or like when I used to yell that as a kid for torquing the sink too hard. Did anybody yell that for this? Like when you turn off the sink, you're torquing it, right? You're breaking, anyway. That's what I got yelled at for all the time. Torque is something that we think about when we're turning a wrench, right? When I tighten the bolt on something, I'm applying a torque. And so I'm applying a force at some distance away from the axis, okay? Torque is something you also hear about, like when you, has anybody ever shopped for a, a high-powered pickup truck? One of the things that they sell, a high-powered pickup truck, is the torque that
that its engine can provide. Okay? It's the amount of force basically applied at some radius from the center. So we're going to talk about it, we're going to define it, and we're going to start to gain an intuition. But to do that, we have to remember and understand some of the things we talked about last time, which were rotational dynamics. So we need this stuff. We didn't just introduce it for fun. We're actually going to use it. So take a, about 30 seconds. This is the question we had basically right at the end or near the end of last lecture. Here's a picture of a family, and it's rotating clockwise. And it says the family is slowing down. What are the signs of the angular velocity and the angular acceleration? Okay. Remember the convention we had? Try to understand from this problem what is omega, what is alpha. So take about 10 more seconds. Well, uh, take about 30 more seconds. <laughs> Okay, about 10 more seconds now. Okay, stop. One, zero, okay, good. Here's what I got, this is good. 82% said that the answer was D. The angular velocity was less than zero. The angular acceleration was greater than zero. What is our convention? A positive angular velocity is? The other way, it's counterclockwise. You're right that it's actually, in this case, negative, right? The reason for that convention is that the x-axis is zero radians, and we rotate this way as we count the increase of radians or degrees, okay? Now, the second part is that it's slowing down, so you can immediately say that the acceleration has to be opposite the velocity, right? If I'm moving forward and I'm slowing down, it means the acceleration is opposite my velocity, and so that only leaves answer D that fits both of those pieces, okay? Now, right at the very end, I introduce these set of equations, and they function identically, okay? So you work quite a bit with what we would call translational or linear kinematics equations. These are the ones that relate accelerations to velocities and displacements, and these are the kind of the four main applications that we typically use. We can write down everything in an identical fashion. If you look, every term of this equation has an equivalent term in the rotational equation. So when you see rotational problems, you'll have these equations on your exam. All of the algebra, everything you apply to this works in exactly the same functional way. So I can ask you about, you know, I, I have a circle that's accelerating with an angular acceleration of alpha, and it starts from an uh, angular velocity of zero, what is its final <coughs> angular velocity? And you can solve that from these equations. Okay? What you have to remember, and we'll talk about it a little bit today, is that you can't easily intermix these two. Right? In any circle, when we have this bicycle wheel, I have something at this point called a tangential velocity or speed. What does it mean to be tangential? It's tangent to the trajectory, right? So I have a tangential speed that's pointed always at a tangent to the circle. But then I have an angular speed, which is the change of the angle of that point as a function of time. And the relationship between them is the radius. And we'll see that in several examples today. Okay? So this was a really good point. Before I start, remember, what was the definition? What did we say in uniform circular motion? Which, what is the acceleration in which direction? Towards the center, and the magnitude is always v squared over r, okay? In that type of motion, we assume there's no acceleration otherwise, right? A point on this circle is always going the same speed, right? That was the definition of uniform acceleration or uniform circular motion. Now, if I have a problem that's like what I just talked about, so this fan speeding up or slowing down, all of that goes away. We have to think really carefully about this. If I start speeding this up, my acceleration is no longer just pointed towards the center. It now has components that are at the tangent, right? If I think about this point, I'm slow, 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 but I'm speeding up. 
So my speed is increasing with time as well. So when we think about the general case of rotational dynamics, we have to think of all of these different accelerations, and it gets really messy really fast. Okay? So let's try to dissect this picture for a second before we kind of get discouraged and bang our head against the desk. Okay? What this picture is doing, it's basically twisting. Can we get it right for you? I'm going to accelerate this way. I start from a stop, right? So I start in this motion diagram up here. Each point in time, I move a little bit longer arc length, right? So what would you say about the tangential speed of this, this kind of motion? Is it getting bigger or getting smaller? The magnitude of the tangential speed is getting bigger, right? At each interval in time, I travel a longer distance. Now, the acceleration, that implies immediately that if I drew a vector of the velocity at the tangent, at one point in time, and then the next point in time, I would have to have an acceleration to increase my speed. And we're going to give this thing a name. We're going to call it the tangential acceleration. It's the acceleration tangent to this circular trajectory. So not only do I have a velocity now, I'm accelerating. I'm changing my velocity vector direction and magnitude. But then we also have this centripetal acceleration which is also changing, because if you remember, the centripetal acceleration goes as v squared over r. If my speed is increasing, you see that this vector, the way we've drawn it, is that this vector gets bigger and bigger and bigger because my speed is getting bigger and bigger. So now this problem gets a bit tricky because I have both a centripetal acceleration, which we'll now call a radial acceleration, meaning it's along the line of the radius, right? It always points towards the center. And I have a tangential acceleration, okay? If I look at this problem, I know that these are vectors, and I can always just draw a sum of those two accelerations. I have the centripetal acceleration plus the tangential gives me a vector at some funny angle, depending on the ratio of those two pieces. Do you see how we've now broken everything we said about uniform circular motion? Now this is what we would say is non-uniform or accelerating. This is circular motion with an angular acceleration, okay? But this can still be understood quite easily. So we first have to understand it piece by piece, and we'll come to see that it's actually quite understandable. So here we break this down into what we would say is centripetal acceleration and tangential. And remember, we, we've started defining these kinematics equations in terms of radial coordinates. So one of the ways we looked at this was the angular velocity is just the change in angle per unit time. And that's what this picture shows. Right? Here's where I started. I moved through some angle theta. The angular velocity is the change in that angle per unit time. Okay? This is basically the same picture, just slightly simpler than what we saw before. Now, we did, I've worked through this now. This is the third time. You can write down the speed as the change in the arc length of this circle per unit time. But remember last time, we could write the arc length as r theta, or r d theta in this case. So s is r theta. And we can re relate the tangential speed to the angular speed with just the radius. Okay? So for instance, in a problem, if I give you the angular velocity, the magnitude of the angular velocity, you can immediately get the speed by multiplying it by the radius. If I have a larger radius, I have a much higher angular, or, well, tangential speed. And then last time we introduced the next one of these, which is the angular uh, acceleration. And this is just the change in the angular velocity. So again, if I have this wheel, and I'm, I'm spinning it, and I start to slow it down, so I start to apply the brakes, my angular velocity is changing. I have to have an angular acceleration. And in this case, it was an angular acceleration that acted to slow the turning down. Just like we said before, we can have a tangential acceleration. This is like your 1D kinematics, so kind of the uh, linear axis. This is just like one-dimensional one kinematics. That's the change in velocity per unit time. But we said just a minute ago that velocity is r times omega, so r times the angular velocity. So I plug that in, and I can see that my 
tangential acceleration is just equal to the radius times the angular acceleration. So for every one of these velocities, displacements, and accelerations, there's a rotational equivalent that I can just relate with the radius constant. And then this one we know, the centripetal acceleration, this is old now, it's always d squared over r. Right? The centripetal acceleration in any circular motion is going to be d squared over r, at least when there's no acceleration. But then I plug again, I just plug in v is r omega squared over r, and I get a different expression that relates centripetal acceleration to angular velocity. Okay? So again, in the problem, if you're given angular velocity, you square it, multiply it by r, and you get the centripetal acceleration. Okay, so these are all the relationships you kind of need. You'll see these on your formula sheets. But that vector that we kind of drew, <coughs> that is the sum total acceleration of a point on the edge of this wheel, we can get by just using the Pythagorean theorem of the two vector components. The total acceleration vector, the magnitude, is just the square root of the tangential component squared plus the centripetal component squared. And I can, again, just using these relationships that I just gave you, I can write this down as r times the square root of the angular acceleration squared plus the angular velocity squared. Okay. So now this little index of equations basically now relates all of what we did before. So one-dimensional velocity, one-dimensional displacement, and one-dimensional acceleration into angular velocity, angular acceleration, and the angular displacement, which is just theta, the angle of the change. Okay? So now you have a series of ways of kind of manipulating these equations to solve various problems. All of this is basically embedded in these equations. Right? The relationship, if I want to find the tangential speed from the angular speed, it's just multiplied by r. And then I can work between these two sets of equations. And you'll see examples of that in your homework. You probably already did, did some of them. So let's just, to keep our minds clear of all this kind of manipulation of algebra, let's come back to this question, which again, showed up last time. So this is a very basic question about these quantities. And the question is this. I'm going to spin this wheel, just like it's shown, right? I'm going to increase its, the speed of that particle as I rotate it counterclockwise. And the question is, which of the following describes the motion? What is the direction of the angular velocity, or angular speed, and the angular acceleration in this problem? Okay? So take about 20 more seconds. Again, this is just review from last time. Okay, so about 10 more seconds. Five. Two. Okay, stop. Good. So I got 89% of you got the right answer. Okay. So 89% of you said A, that the angular velocity is positive. We define that as the positive direction. And I'm speeding up. So the angular acceleration is in the positive direction. Here's the next question, and this is going to be important for what we're going to talk about next. If I apply, if I have this thing sitting still, just like we showed, what do I have to do to cause it to accelerate? I see people kind of doing the motion. What's it called? It's applying a force. Okay? So in order for me, to accelerate this wheel, I have to apply a force. Which direction, at that point that I've shown in the picture where I started, which direction would give you the best acceleration? If I applied a force at this point on your right, which way should I push it to make it do what that diagram does? I see a couple different answers. I see kind of diagonal up. So intuitively, we would say, yeah, I want to push in the direction of the circle. What we'll see in a second is the best place to push is exactly at that point 
and as hard up as I possibly can. What I do in real life is I keep my hand on there until I get it accelerated. So I'm changing the force's direction as I go. But what I would say is if I had only one direction of force, I would just point up as hard as I can. Okay? What do we call that force applied at a radial distance from the center of a circle? We just said at the beginning. This is called a torque. Okay? So now you see that there's a relationship between this force applied and how it accelerates. And that, that thing is going to be called torque. Let's see if you understand a little bit about torque. I've seen people do this all the time. Who's ever tried to be polite and hold the door for someone? <laughs> Some of you did. Who's ever done this? What are you? Okay. Let me try to open this one. You, you, you try, somebody's walking through, and you try to open a door that pushes out. And you go through this little, like, you try to be aggressive, and you kind of stutter because it's really heavy. Right? Why does that happen? It's hard to push a door that way. If you look at this picture, you can actually maybe imagine where the easiest place to push a door. Let's see. There are four forces shown. Here's the door looking down. What is the best place, if I have a constant force, my strength is fixed, which is the best position on this door to cause it to accelerate in that rotational degree? Okay. So take about 30 seconds. So which would be the most effective in opening the door? Okay, about 10 more seconds. I got most of the people. Oh, okay. I heard what about this Okay. Get your last in. It looks like most people have them. Okay, good. So we actually do have a good intuition for torque. Almost 90% of you said that the force F1 is the one that you would apply. You can notice if you go out these doors and push the door open, you will find that the easiest place to push is very far from the hinge and straight into the door. That will create the greatest acceleration for your push, your force. Like I was showing you before, this is what happens when you try to hold the door to somebody and it's too close to the hinge. In order to get it to move, for that fixed force, I have to push a lot harder to get the door to open. Okay? So try this, next time you're being polite, try to hold the door like this, and you'll find that it's kind of frustrating. You're <laughs> kind of like a weakling. You're like, oh, I'm sorry, I tried, right? <laughs> but we have an intuition for this now, that for some reason, we would say that if I had a constant force, I would go as far from the hinge as possible, and I would push straight in a perpendicular direction to the surface of that door. Now, why isn't F3 as good? Now that you know something about physics, do you know why F3 doesn't do quite as well. The reason is that this vector has a smaller component in that direction of push pushing into the door. This vector, why doesn't this vector do any good? <laughs> why doesn't it do any good? It's not going to accelerate. It's not going to give an angular acceleration. <laughs> it's like as though I pushed into the side of this wheel to try to get it going. Right? It's not going to work. So do you see that this vector F3, it has one component that's in this axis, what we might call the x-axis, which is doing nothing. It's not providing a torque. You're just jamming yourself into the door with some component of force that's useless. The component that is perpendicular to this length of door is the only piece that's going to accelerate. And so the best one is F1 because it's all in that direction. Okay, so we have a little bit of an intuition but now we can start to quantify this, and this is what we're going to call torque. When we think about rotating an object, the ability of a force to cause a rotation depends on exactly three things. It depends on the magnitude of the force, right? If I push really hard, I'm going to rotate it at a higher acceleration. That should be intuitive by now, right? Newton's law. The distance r from the point of application to the pivot. So the larger, who's ever done this? Who's ever seen a torque wrench? How long is a typical torque wrench for your car? Anybody know? Yeah, there's something like 30 inches, sometimes 36 inches. A torque wrench 
Why is the torque wrench so big? If I'm screwing on a lug on my wheel over here, I want to be working way out here. There's another thing called a breaker bar. Has anyone ever used a breaker bar? If you have a bolt that's rusted on, you take a bar and it extends your wrench by another three feet. What you're doing is you're increasing the distance, R, from the point of application to the pivot. The further I apply my force from that pivot point, the more it's going to accelerate. Right? And the last piece is that the angle theta at which the force is applied. If I have some theta that's at an angle, it's going to be less. And we'll define these angles in a second. The best way to get a high torque to apply the most angular acceleration to this door is to be as far from the hinge as possible, push perpendicular to the length of that door at some angle that is basically zero. Right? I want to be perfectly perpendicular to the door. So when we define this, and this is what it looks like in the textbook, here's my pivot, here's a wrench kind of around a, a bolt. That's my pivot point. And I'm going to apply a force here at some distance r. Now, which, which, which sign of angular acceleration would this produce? If I apply this force at perpendicular, which sign of acceleration is this? Positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Okay. This is where we're going to have a hard time keeping track. If I'm rotating in a counterclockwise way, that's a positive acceleration. So the way the torque works is that there's a component of F, this is the force I apply, that is perpendicular to the radial line. That's what causes the torque. This F perpendicular causes the torque. The parallel component doesn't do anything, right? Again, imagine if this thing was fixed and I tried to pull it straight out to the side, I'm not going to give a rotation to the bolt. I'm just going to yank the wrench right off and cry and lament that I don't understand how the world works, right? So torque is due to the component of the force perpendicular to the radial line. So when we talk about torque over the next several weeks, including on your exam, the torque is exactly what we just said. It's the radius, so how far from the pivot point, times the perpendicular force that you apply at that point. So in this case, if I have an angle, V, from which F is basically deviating from that straight line, in the way that I've drawn this, I take the sine of that angle, that gives me the perpendicular component of that vector f, and my torque is the radius times the magnitude of f, and this is basically its perpendicular component. Okay? And the unit of torque is a bit of a weird one. If, you, if you're familiar with cars, sometimes called these foot-pounds, right? I need this many foot-pounds. Most car wrenches are foot-pounds, but the MKS version of that is a force times a distance, or a newton meter. Okay? So think about when I see these units, it means I apply some number of newtons at some distance in meters away from the pivot point. That's my force F applied perpendicular to this radius R. Now there's one other way to think about this. This is from the textbook. I'm going to show it. I'm not usually going to use this version, but it's for some people if you like it. There's another way to understand torque. Hold on, let's get one more question left is that basically I can define this thing as a line of action. So if I draw my radius, I draw that force and I can dash a line. Imagine I take that force and I draw a dash line out to infinity. I draw a perpendicular to it, and then I can immediately define this angle phi. In the end, doing this gives exactly the same quantity. That the torque is just the radius times the perpendicular component of, in this case, the radial vector rather than Okay? They're perfectly equivalent because in the end, it gives you the sign of that angle. So what happens if this angle is zero? What is my torque if the angle that I've defined here is zero? The torque is zero. That's the weird force that would just pull the wrench off of the bolt. It's not going to rotate it. If that angle is 90, the sine function is its biggest. It goes to one. And so I get a torque that is just the force times the radius. Okay? I'll, I'll go by on this one next time, but let's just see if we understand this quantitatively before we run off today. So take a, take a minute or so with the people beside you. Which of these parts is the largest? Here's the pivot point, this little point here. 
These forces are exactly now quantified. Two newtons, four newtons, some angles. Which of these would be the strongest torque to rotate this rigid object? And just to remind you, So the torque is defined this way, it's the radius times the perpendicular force. Sure. That's not the question. Which is the largest? So does that mean which is the hardest to which which maximizes this number? Which maximizes? Yeah, which one's the bigger? Okay, let me stop. Let me pause for a second. So I have a lot of answers in, but not all of them, but I'm just gonna pause. So I had a really good question. Listen for a second. The question from the front said, look at A and D. Right? This says, let's call the, the radius. Out to here, let's call that just R, okay? The torque in this one is two newtons times R, right? So two newtons times R. The torque in this one is four newtons, but the radius is half. So what does that equal? It's two newtons times R. So the question was, aren't A and B the same? Are they the same? Yes. But what's the question? Which is the largest? Is there one here that's larger than it, right? Here's, we'll, we'll leave on this one, we'll come back to it. Oops. It's killing it for me. What is the sine of 45 degrees? If you put it in your calculator, what is the sine of 45 degrees? Type it in. Somebody give me a number, three digits of accuracy. 0 0.70, 707. If I take four newtons, and I multiply it by 0 0.707, is that bigger than two? Absolutely. These were two newtons times r. This one is 0 0.707 times four times r, which is the biggest. We'll come back to this one. 